A man chooses, a slave obeys. Welcome to the Ethics and Video Games podcast, where we explore issues at the intersection of ethics and video games. What follows is a series of graphic, interactive scenes that we can't show you. All right, everybody, we're here today with Dr. Marcus Carter, a researcher in digital cultures and human computer interaction. Uh, he completed his PhD in the Interaction Design Lab at the University of Melbourne in 2015, studying the design and player experience of the game Eve Online. And we are going to be talking a lot about Eve Online. Wow, what an interesting game. Um, He's currently a senior lecturer at the Digital Culture um, in Digital Culture at the University of Sydney. Uh, Dr. Carter has published extensively in game studies on a range of titles such as Eve Online, uh, and we're not sure if it's Days or Daisy. So let's go with Daisy for today. I, I'm pretty sure it's Daisy because it's a zombie game, right? Z makes sure for zombies, right? Uh, Candy Crush Saga, uh, Warhammer 40,000, and the reality TV series Survivor, which uh, we may talk about today as uh, as a game. Uh, his book, Treacherous Play, is out now very recently with MIT Press, and that is what we're going to talk today uh, about, Treacherous Play. Uh, Marcus Carter, welcome to the show. Yay! Thanks very much, guys. <laughs> Happy to be here. All right. So... We got lots of questions, so we, let's go right uh, to it. Uh, what is Treacherous Play? It's a, it's a great title. It sounds evil. Tell us about it. Okay, so I define in the book Treacherous Play as the lawful use of deception to betray another person in a multiplayer game by choice, where it provides an in-game advantage. So you've got a lot of components to this, but basically what I'm trying to do with that definition is to distinguish what I'm talking about from similar but crucially quite different types of play. Right? So when we play something like poker, we are deceiving one another. But I'm not choosing to betray you, uh, Andy, and, and, right. and not you, Shlomo, right? We're put on certain teams, and I'm, and, you know, in the case of poker, we're all against one another. Um, in a month, like, game like Among Us, like one of us is given the role of the person who is doing the betraying and doing the deceiving. But what's really fascinating about an MMO like EVE Online or the reality TV show Survivor is we're actually given the ability to choose whether or not we're a player who betrays. We're not given that role. And that freedom, that choice, really totally transforms the player experience. Mm -hmm. and, and what we're talking about and, and what makes Structure's Play so interesting is, and, and such an ethical question, is that if I tell you you have to betray another player in the game, it, it, that absolves you. Right, yeah. it, it absolves Completely. you of the blame, the choice to do it. But if you're choosing to do it and you didn't have to, and the only reason that you're doing it is to get advantage in the game, that's on you. And that makes it a really fascinating player experience to betray someone, to be betrayed by someone, and a really interesting ethical question when it comes to multiplayer gameplay. Awesome. Before we get into examples, and you've got some great examples, so I want to talk about those. Really quick, I'm thinking about the difference between... So in poker, I have the option of bluffing right and yeah. i might be thinking specifically you know i'm sitting around i'm thinking marcus that guy he's gonna fall for my bluff so notice i might even like specifically have you in mind right to fall for my bluff in among us i get assigned the role right, right. to essentially betray you so i really have to do it Right. Is, and there's tons of there's tons of board games that do this as well. Have we literally we there's we call it a traitor mechanic, you know where like in you know uh, uh, betrayal house on the hill like at some point during the game something happens and you're handed a book and you're said and and now you are the bad guy. Right. So it's so it's interesting there and in Among Us you are you know again you have to do it. That's why I'm going back to the poker example. Isn't mm -hmm. the poker example like? You know, situation where I can just choose to uh, bluff if I want. Is that the same thing as betraying you in treacherous play or is it different? It, it, it's not quite the same. So uh, one thing I think we've got to remember is that games are like social practices. And so depending on the context of the game, uh, certain things can become acceptable when they might not otherwise have been acceptable, right? In a World Cup right. final, it's between me and you and the goal and I do a very aggressive sliding tackle, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Like, no one's going to be upset at me. 
But if I use the same sliding tackle against my six-year-old nephew in a backyard game of soccer, <laughs> people are going to get really upset. So I think the mm. in the example of uh, poker where we're talking about should I choose to utilize this weapon in my toolkit, right? right. I can use my uh, betting strategy to maybe throw you off. That's a bit of deception. I can exclaim angrily when I look at my cards as a bit of acting, <laughs> as a bit of deception, right? right I've got right. all of these like weapons in my toolkit. Uh, but with poker, you and I are definitely on opposing teams. Yes. The, the right. whole goal of playing that game is, is me against you. And so we might choose in a friendly game not to utilize all of the weapons in our toolkit to, to throw you off. I might know something about you personally, Shlomo, and I might start hinting at possibly revealing that if you continue to <laughs> um, meet my bet, right? It's a weapon in my mm. toolkit, but I'm not always going to use it. What's really exciting about the use of deception and betrayal in a game like E Online is how rich and um, integral the community of players is, right? We have these alliances that have been going for decades now mm -hmm. with hundreds of intimate friendships and co um, massive coalitions of tens of thousands of players. So how do we have these incredible social structures? Well, at the same time, any one of those players could decide at any minute to just betray everybody, take everything, take all the gold that they've got, be paid off by another alliance to help win a war. How do, how do we form these social relationships in that context? It's just such a fascinating question to me. Okay, so before we get and and we're gonna go into Eve Online today, uh, listeners, right? And you know, deep into this fascinating world. Before we do that, can we get some examples uh, just of your know, treacherous play? Uh, and feel free to any kind of examples you want to give us. So in Eve Online, or just uh, any from anywhere? Let Let's go from anywhere, and then later we'll get into Eve Online. Yeah, I mean, so in DayZ is a multiplayer, you know, survival game. You encounter other people in the game. And, and you know, the, the game world is harsh. So one of the options available to you is that you can talk to that player. It uses a proximity chat. So you could choose to team up with that player to survive and play along together. And a lot of players do because that social experience in the game it is really exciting. Mm -hmm. And now let's say I come across, Shlomo, you come across me in the game and I, and I use the little... I can make my avatar put his hands up in the air and I can say, friendly, don't shoot. That's how we might try to start uh, initiating a, a friendship within the game. And then as soon as you turn around, we talk for a little bit, but as soon as you turn around, I pull out my shotgun and I shoot you in the head. Ooh. That would be an example of treacherous <laughs> play, right? I'm using deception to betray you and I'm gaining the advantage because in Daisy, as soon as I've killed you, I can loot your body and I can get all of these gray items that you've got from playing for a few hours. You did. In Survivor, an example right. of treacherous play is jumping is saying to someone, promising, hey, Andy, I'm not going to write your name down tonight. I promise you I'm not going to write your name down tonight. And then writing that person's name down because it gets me further in the game. Right. And you know why I'm doing it. It's not because I don't like you, Andy. Great guy. Fun to play Survivor with. I'm sure. But I want to get further in the game. And it's... I could get further in the game by being loyal, by being trustworthy, but I can also get further in the game by using deception and betrayal. And I have this choice to do it in both of those cases. I didn't have to write your name down. Right. I hadn't been and assigned the role of being Andy's opponent. I didn't have to shoot you in the back of the head, Shlomo, but I did. Right. I chose to because that's what I thought would get me advantage in the game. And, I, and one of the things I think that's interesting about this is that both of these games are games that... Um, implicitly or explicitly uh, ask you to be social with one another as part of the game, not yeah. just as, as, as players sitting around a table as you might be in a poker game or something like that. But within the game, you're being asked to create some sort of social links to each other, uh, yep. either implicitly or explicitly. Uh, uh, Shlomo, another example, and this is classic sort of high school Dungeons and Dragons play when I was when I was in high school is, you know, one person decides to be the thief. Now they're called rogues because uh, uh, for this very reason, probably. And, you know, we get out into the dungeon and then the thief in the middle of the night uh, steals from all of us, his his party members. And you're oh. like, dude. <laughs> How do you, you know? play together after that point? Well, right, it, it was. It's very hard. It was. It's one of the. It was one of the challenges of keep sometimes of keeping groups together because there would be that one guy, right, 
But when you're in a massive online player game, that doesn't matter because you can steal from your party and then go join another party and befriend them and then steal exactly. from them or shoot them in the back with uh, the head with a shotgun, etc. Why what? we're playing a game where sometimes you're going to find meet people in DayZ who are going to shoot shoot you before they start talking to you, right? Right. And so why is me using my words, using my social abilities, any less legitimate of a way to defeat you uh, and using a gun. I'm not, I'm not very quick. I've got an old you know, $20 mouse. I'm not great at the shooting in the game, but I can trick people into getting myself good weapons much faster than I can beat you in a firefight. Why is using the gun more legitimate than using my words? Right. So I, I don't know. So I wanted to ask about, you say that there's three common assumptions that people make about treacherous play that make you think that, uh, that, that you think are wrong. And I'm assuming that these assumptions essentially play into answering that question, right? Which is why there's something particular, why we feel there's something so wrong about this kind of betrayal. So can you tell us about those, those three assumptions? Yeah. So the kind of three assumptions that, uh, you know, I've been studying treacherous play for a long time kind of started probably in 20 started thinking about and talking about this in academic and personal context in kind of 2012 and there's kind of three assumptions that i really get when i'm talking to people about it, right the first is that this is unethical this is like an in inherently unethical thing to do that and well, that's slightly so why but that to me seems like a really interesting question to explore because it's not to say that I have, I think, the answers to this or the resolutions to whether or not treacherous play is unethical. But these assumptions are what makes it a really interesting topic to explore. A lot of people think, okay, well, that's got to be an unethical way to play. Shooting you in the back of the head after tricking you is somehow worse. It, fe it does feel, right, <laughs> somehow worse than just shooting you in a firefight. And, and that's a really interesting question because that requires us to start thinking about what makes any form of competition in a multiplayer game ethical at all. Right? We have to be able to answer that question to be able to say, oh, it's treacherous play and ethical. There's this other assumption about treacherous play that it's like antisocial or it's like a form of griefing and trolling. I remember when I was like doing my honors thesis at the end of my undergraduate degree, which is also on EVE Online but unrelated, and I had a little like kind of vignette about the theft in EVE Online. And I asked my dad to proofread my thesis before I submitted it. And he wrote in the margins, and you play with these people? <laughs> <laughs> and look, I, I'd admit it. If I found out that my accountant was like running a Ponzi scheme in an EVE Online bank in, <laughs> for the last six years and had made off with $60,000, I get a little bit nervous. But it's, again, it's, it's what makes... How do we understand... Neg play with negative affect where well, the things that we do in a game might negatively affect other people as not can that be not griefing could it can it ever be possible for me to upset you, right and and surely it has to be because if we're playing poker my goal here is to bankrupt you your fun experience of playing poker is contingent on me trying as hard as possible to take your money otherwise right. it's just it's just not appealing so how is it that we can understand Making other people have a bad time, not to be antisocial or, or a form of griefing. It's, and then it's, the third... I, I, I want to add to that. First of all, for uh, our audience that doesn't know what griefing means, right? Griefing essentially is your intentionally uh, part of your play, part of your fun is making other people suffer. Right. So, yep. you know, think about what trolls do, that the kind of fun the trolls get. And you would think that the example from uh, Day Z or would Marcus, as Marcus said, it, uh, Day Z, um, right, is uh, going to be, you know, the guy that tricks you with a shotgun. Maybe he's just fucking with you. Maybe the whole point yep. of what he's doing is just to have fun getting you to trust somebody and then enjoying how betrayed you now feel. Right. So, it, it, are, is the is the person doing that? Are they motivated by griefing, by the upset that it causes, or are they motivated by the same reason you would be motivated to kill them with a gun, which is to get their good gear and loot that they've acquired playing the game? Right. And and so, and then third assumption being, uh, are these people bad? Fundamentally bad people. We see this really come up a lot in Survivor because one of the coolest mechanics in games design is how at the end of a season of Survivor, the players who have lost choose yeah. out of the remaining players who wins hmm. and boy does some of so those good. players get upset and angry <laughs> at the people who've betrayed them and that really exposes for for like our analysis and our interrogation this 
belief that if you choose to betray someone in a gang, you are fundamentally a bad person. You are not a good person. And that's really interesting because I do a lot of really bad stuff in video games. Like I, right. I, I just always just execute every prisoner I've caught at the end of a total war battle. So, and I recently <laughs> unlocked an achievement where I'd killed like a million, uh, a million enemies in, in, in total war games because of the way that I just kill everybody at the end of the match, at the end of the battle. Does that make me a bad person? And I, I don't. I don't think it does, and I don't no. think people would assume that it made me a bad person. But boy, do we think that people who betray people in a game are bad people? And, and why and, is unless, that? Unless, unless the game is is it has stated that it's okay to betray people, right? Exactly. Right. It, it, among us, uh, mm. it, it, the, that trader mechanic we were talking about, it gives people an excuse. But if you're choosing to betray, right? Yeah. It, it, it suddenly becomes. Like you are fundamentally not a good person. So how? How? What? Why is that? Those. Those are the kind of key questions I wanted to explore uh, with this book and in my research. So going back to Survivor, it seems like, like, you know, your entire the game is about getting other people kicked off. So why is why do people get so upset about it in Survivor? That seems like it's it's right there. It's this. this it feels like the game, right? It feels like the game. So what? But they do. And um, I mean, some of the, uh, I went through kind of a couple, a couple of seasons specifically. There's an amazing player, Russell Hance, mm -hmm. who played through his season, got to the end and, and just dominated. And then he did, back, very few people have done this, he did back-to-back -back seasons because the season after his season was a returning player season. So it was a heroes versus villains. And he was brought in. <laughs> And he filmed this second season before he knew the results of the first season because it all gets. Oh. They film two seasons back to back, and they what, and then they air it, and then they do the result back in uh, um, LA Live. Right. And so wow. Russell was uh, on two seasons, got to the end both seasons, but he doesn't know he hasn't doesn't know the outcome of his first season while he's playing his second season, and he doesn't win either season because he played that game so relentlessly, so ruthlessly <laughs> that people just didn't, just couldn't, couldn't reward him, even though he, he had clearly dominated the, the, the seasons that he played. Right. Like he did stuff like he burnt the socks of everybody on his team because he knew that if people were more miserable and more upset with one another, they would be more easy to manipulate and control. Can, can, can I, can I ask here? I mean, that's, that's really interesting, right? Uh, because on the one hand, it seems like, look, this is just another game mechanic. Betraying people whenever you have the opportunity to, to get ahead is, but um, I'm thinking of other possibilities where undermining the psychological effectiveness of, of other players would also kind of go into that. So humiliating another player, let's say in order to destroy them psychologically, I mean, that seems that seems to me at least instinctively to be really bad. I mean, that's just an awful thing to do to humiliate someone. It but can't humiliation uh, just be seen as yet another way to get them to be psychologically overwhelmed or disengaged with the game? So it's right. easier it's, for it's you to win. It's another weapon in my toolkit, right? It's it, right. It, it, so it's it's if I could use that to beat beat you, why shouldn't I? Right. And, and there is an example of that, right? We trash talk one another. And in professional basketballers, really try to piss each other off, to throw each other off their game. Uh, in tennis, mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, there's Australian Open recently, a couple of years ago, you've got guys sledging each other about some of the girls that they're, they're seeing and, and, and stuff and just trying to really, because if you can upset your opponent, you might be able to win. How right. do we approach this huge variety of things that we can do when we're playing in, in a multiplayer game. Right. How do we know and how does kind of, how do we come to agree with one another that that aggressive sliding tackle of my six-year-old nephew in that backyard soccer game isn't okay <laughs> then, but it would be okay in the world final. If I'm, you know, in that same background, if I start belittling my six-year-old nephew, um, talking smack talk about his mum, it, that's not okay, but it, it might be okay in in a, a NBA game because I'm, I'm I might be able to throw that uh, player off their game. How how do we how how do we come to these agreements? These implicit um, 
agreements that some things are okay and some things aren't. That's and a why, great question. Why do some things land on the on the on the different sides of this equation? Right. I I I do want to point out, and that's a great great question. And I want to point out that there's always limits. I mean, there are limits to trash talk, right? Even on the highest level, right? Even if we're going to, mm. there's always. I things, don't know, but I don't know about that at the highest level. I don't think there are limits. I don't know. I mean, talking about someone's <laughs> uh, racial insults. Oh you know? yeah, true, true. Right? I mean, that's that's not going to be okay, right? I mean, yeah. there th there are things that we essentially, for every context, right? We think that you can go too far. Though I think Marcus is great to ask, how do we, you know, how do we draw that line? Is there and and notice the fact that we psychologically might feel that some of these things matter more than others, and psychologically that we might be more affected by betrayals than other game mechanics you know, doesn't is, talk to the morality of it necessarily. Is it, so from a game design point of view, like the games in which we build in trader mechanics um, or any mechanic where, or any mechanic where somebody can get eliminated, uh, like in survivor player elimination, um, we try to do that in such a way that once somebody's eliminated, the game gets resolved pretty quickly so that they can play again. Mm. And Right, but the real reason is because we don't want them to lose. That we don't, or not that we don't want. We don't care about them losing well, that, the game. We don't. We don't want them to have any any sense of loss that they have lost something besides just the game. Because the game, win or lose, who but cares? That's another thing. That's that's another thing that's really interesting about all of these games that I look at. Even online, if you uh, if someone steals from you, that money is gone. Right, you're not right. getting that back. But that's the same for combat in Eve Online. If your spaceship gets destroyed. It is. It is essentially. It is destroyed. The value is is lost to you. You don't respawn in a new spaceship. So people right, are you experience loss. Spaceships worth the equivalent of thousands of dollars, and then they lose. Daisy, when you die, you don't respawn with all of your gear. You respawn with nothing on the beach, and you have to scavenge and crawl your way back to that position of power again. Oh. And in survival, when you get voted out, even if you get if you get voted out because you lost a challenge, if you get voted out because uh, no, there was no betrayal involved. Everybody said that they were going to vote you out. You're out of the game. The, the loss doesn't change because you are being betrayed. It's not somehow worse because you're being betrayed. And that's what makes these games so interesting for these questions and why I think treacherous play has, is successful in them. Because if, if, there was a, if it was disproportionate, if the loss from betrayal was somehow massively greater than the loss from any of the other weapons in my toolkit to beat you in, the, in, in that multiplayer game, it would, it, that would be why we don't like it. But we, right. the loss from betrayal is equivalent to the other forms of loss in the game. So why then is it still so upsetting? Why then do so many players quit EVE Online because they are betrayed in a way where they don't quit because their spaceship was destroyed, even if there was equivalent levels of loss? Oh. Marcus, right. do you have – so this seems like a psychological question that someone like you might be studying these games – and be able could be able to answer psychologically. Notice again the ethical question is going to be: um, Are they right to judge these kind of betrayals as particularly bad? Right? Uh, do you have any answer, by the way, to the psychological question of why we tend to think that these are worse? Yeah. So there's uh, a great concept called betrayal aversion that some behavioral psychologists identified in kind of random. Uh, number games, uh, chance-based games, you are much less likely to, uh, your wager is decreased if you think that you're be there's a possibility of being betrayed as opposed to playing against a random number generator. Mm -hmm. And the re and that's, they, that, that they argue that that's because losing at, but being perceived with being betrayed and having that loss has an extra cost, right? Being betrayed has this extra psychological cost that oh. can be measured in these number games that pe that they can make people play. Oh, that's I've, interesting. Like, like, like I've been tricked, therefore it's a worse loss. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and, and we can see, you know, how that kind of can come about as, as, as being beneficial to us. But I am also pretty like, reluctant to say, hey, we can study a game like EVE Online and we can learn about people and their perceptions of betrayal because there's a lot of role play going on and the attraction to these, all of these are dystopic imaginaries, right? EVE Online is this hyper-capitalistic, 
like just awful, harsh universe. <laughs> Marcus, can you tell us about, about EVE Online? EVE Online is a massively multiplayer online game that was from 2003. So it's one of the longest uh, running MMOs. And unlike other MMOs that kind of have a peak in popularity and then a kind of waned EVE Online, although it's not doing great over the last kind of 12 to 18 months, has kind of had a consistent level of popularity uh, since its release. Uh, maybe a slight trend to increase over time. And that's because it offers a very niche experience, which is a very harsh, a very hard, and a very unforgiving one. People typically refer to it as Excel Online because so many people use spreadsheets to help augment their play of the game. But basically, mm -hmm. the premise is that you are an immortal capture leader. So you have clones, and when you die, one of your clones is reactivated. Um, but the ship that you were flying has been destroyed. And it's set kind of, um, there was a wormhole to another galaxy. Humankind traveled over there. That wormhole just collapsed, destroying a lot of things. Uh, and then these societies have been rebuilt in the ashes. And you are kind of this extra governmental totally independent race of super beings who, uh, and, and everything in the game is uh, kind of about economics and, and money. So you mine to, you, there are people who play as miners, they'll mine the resources and sell those resources on the market. There are people who play as industrialists who buy those resources and use that to build spaceships. And then there are people who are playing the PvP elements of the game or the PvE elements of the game. And they'll buy those spaceships and they'll fly them to try and gain more resources and, and more rewards. And it makes sense in that environment that uh, some of us are going to get together and we're going to fight you to get better access to those rewards and those resources. And a large portion of the game is what in what we refer to as, as what I refer to as null sex. So there's zero security for players. So anyone can attack you at any time. And so players can claim sovereignty over this space and have these big alliances of ten, hundreds of thousands and tens of thousands of players who kind of hold and protect and enrich themselves from this territory that they're able to claim. And uh, and before we get into, I want to hear some nice scamming stories. Uh, but be before, <laughs> can, can you, um, we talked a little bit about this before the show. Can you explain, how does someone like you study, uh, um, you know, a, a game like EVE Online? Yeah, how would you even go about this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. It's, so back when, a um, long time ago, when I finished my undergraduate degree, I was looking at, doing a honors thesis in um, science and technology studies. And I was kind of looking around and, and I saw EVE Online as a game that I had briefly played but never really committed to because it's a difficult game and it requires playing at certain times. you kind of got to play at certain times. You've got to play quite a bit to kind of be any good at it. And I just thought this was such a weird game. <laughs> Right, this, this is such a harsh world. People betray each other. You can't trust anyone. Like the number one rule of Eve Online, um, it's in the trailers for the game. It's what everybody says in Reddit and forums and Discord. Don't trust anyone. And so I wanted to look at the communities, the this. Why? What are the? What's the nature of these communities? These online communities in this environment where you can't trust anyone. What is? How does that change what these communities are? So I did a honors project on that and you know did, did some surveys and stuff and that kind of didn't really learn much other than how to write a better survey rather than surveys are kind of crap for learning about <laughs> rich and complex issues mm -hmm. and so then i rolled in phd and and by that stage i'd kind of realized hey this is i've read a lot of game studies literature and they're all making assumptions about how games work and what games are that are com completely non-compatible with this difficult, deeply unfun, uh, harsh and, and kind of toxic game. So I was like, I'm gonna go and study, I'm, I'm gonna go do this. And so the back in, uh, you know, in the, through the 2000s, well, another really popular methodology for studying games um, was uh, ethnography or virtual ethnography. Um, and, and in part that was because the games that were really standing out as being this new and incredible thing were games like World of Warcraft and Second Life and EverQuest. And there were just some really fantastic ethnographies of these games by scholars like T.L. Taylor's work on EverQuest, uh, Tom Bolstra's work on Second Life, and Mark Chen's work on uh, World of Warcraft were really kind of influential to me as saying, hey, the, these scholars have got an incredible insight into what I, as someone who kind of grew up playing games, the ways in which they mean a lot to me. 
that they are these deeply rich, powerful, challenging uh, cultures. So et- and ethnographies look at the culture themselves, right, in these universes, yeah. right? Looking at the culture, but also bringing a kind of immersion to it. So ethnography having a, a kind of history of, you know, Western researchers going into um, develop the developing world in, into the global south and kind of spending a year in a village somewhere on an island and then coming and then extracting knowledge and then coming back and writing about it and right. being a career, which clearly is a, a method with its with some significant problems. But the <laughs> What it was pop, very, very popular at that time to employ that method to study these worlds as places, as, as, as almost as though they were a physical field site that you could go to. Mm-hmm. So I set out doing my PhD, and I was like, I'm going to do, I'm going to study these games, this game for 12 months. I'm going to immerse myself in it. And so I, I played the game pretty intensely for for 12 months, and to kind of become a member of a community and really, and the strength of that is that you really start to understand the community. Uh, um, and what's going on and you get access to things because people have seen you around and you've posted dumb memes in chat and um, joined some of the battles and, and um, being useful and, uh, and contributing you kind of get access to people and topics and understanding them but what amazed me is even after 12 months I was I'm, I was a pretty terrible e online player I was not a good e online player <laughs> that was a difficult game with unparalleled <laughs> levels of investment required and i kind of mm-hmm. uh, afterwards I, it, and it was not a game that was compatible with maybe being a successful phd student right uh, but that gave me but, so throughout that whole time i'm talking to people <laughs> and I'm, I'm observing and and that was really great because it gave me um i guess the legitimacy to talk to people not as uh maybe someone who hates games right there's a lot of negative discourse around games being addictive and violence and bad for you. So people kind of knew me as a player and knew I wasn't going to kind of have that take. Um, I was able to kind of talk to some of the people who were involved in the espionage aspects of the game and they were able to see, well, he's probably not a spy for another alliance. Although I do think that would have been a very, very good cover story. Pretend to study in an alliance for six months and then get access to the spy metagame and sell that to someone else. Um, (laughs) And but equally, I was able to kind of say, "Hey, I, I kind of understand the game, but I do not understand scamming." And that was something that I never personally engaged in. Uh, some discussion with my PhD supervisors about the ethics of doing that as a as a researcher, betraying other people in the game and scamming other people in the game. Uh, so I never personally did that. So I was able to say, "Hey, this is something that I've not done. Can you explain it to me?" And that was a really great positionality for learning more about scamming why people scammed what it was like to get scammed and, and the espionage game in even like too so it's, hold on i, okay, I need to yeah. ask i need to ask and it's probably the same question shlomo was about okay. to ask um even when your your advisors were saying hey this behavior is unethical for you to do as a researcher or is this just is it unethical behavior and we would rather you didn't do unethical behavior it was so in Australia and I uh, know in the US you've got institutional review boards in Australia we call them human research ethics committees. Um, we felt that it wouldn't pass the ethics committee to do it because there would be such a strong perception by the, that ethics committee who aren't gamers, right? Who are just kind of reviewing different ethics applications from across the university that going in and betraying other people as a researcher could potentially. Uh, be a violation of the responsibilities that we have as researchers is not to harm the communities that we're researching. Mm-hmm. That in itself is was a fascinating question to me. I talk about that at length in my thesis because I was going into these games and I was destroying a lot of spaceships. I destroyed right. thousands of dollars of other people's spaceships and they were, I'm sure they were as upset as, if they were anywhere near as upset as I was when my spaceship got destroyed, <laughs> I was doing a lot of harm playing the game with people. <laughs> right. but, there was a, but that's the game. I, yeah, and I could point to the you know the support pages from CCP Games, the developer of Eve Online, where they say this is legal. You are allowed to betray people. You are allowed to scam people. If, if you lose money because of misplaced trust, that's how they define it. That's that's within the rules of the game, and we're not going to do anything to help you. Um, but we just, I didn't feel like I needed to betray people to understand it. I did feel like I needed to play the game and understand the game to be able to understand it. So we decided yeah. not to in the end. That, you know, that said, uh, for, first of all, by the way, for listeners, a lot of money can be at stake. We're talking about real world money. 
right? All of these things, right? Like ships can be sold, right? Uh, so, so there's that. Marcus, but when it comes down to it, just to kind of get you on the record here, uh, and I know you're probably you're on the record in your book, but do you think there is anything there is anything wrong about a researcher of Eve Online engaging in scams? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, and, and I think we'll talk. I think we should come back to that question at the end. Okay. We talked a little bit more about scams because it's let's not let's hear about scams. Let's let's hear some scams. Scams are complicated, right? Okay. So the most simple scam. Uh, in EVE Online is double your ISK. So ISK is the currency in the game. And it's you say to someone, hey, send me money and I'll send you back double the money that you send me. And a lot of people post this chat in like the kind of big solar systems where there's a lot of players. And you might send them in 100 ISK and they'll send you 200 back. And they'll send them 1,000 ISK and then they'll send you 2,000 back. And then as soon as you send them any more, they, they take you. Right? Very simple scam, surprisingly effective. Talk to a guy who had a, who'd written a bot to post this and do it. And and he was just making his <laughs> passive income. Of it's so him. simple that he could write a bot to do it for him. Yes. <laughs> wow. Uh, and totally within the rules of the game. And it's it's often people's first introduction to hey this virtual you know people do this in the starting areas and it's like, hey this this uh this game is a bit different to World of Warcraft to so these other MMOs I might have played before. I'm I'm on my own here. I have to. I'm not. There's not a moderator who I can appeal to when I misplace my trust. Another one I really like is there's a ship, uh, a Caron. Uh, it's a, a mid-level ship in Eve, and it's pretty expensive. Um, costs a few, I think it's a, a few billion these days to, to buy one of these ships. Uh, and so what you do is you post uh, in chat a link to a contract for one Caron ship, you know, 500 million isk. But then you put the contract as 50 million isk. And so people, someone who's like thinking goes, oh, they made a typo. I'm going to quickly click buy now. And what they actually bought was one carbon resource. Because it looks, when you're in a rush, because <laughs> you think you're taking advantage of someone else's stupidity, that you <laughs> click buy, oh, great. So you just spent 50 million times the price of a carbon resource mm. uh, because you were being a bit too greedy and you didn't do the due diligence. So there's, a, there's quite a few of these small <laughs> tricks that you can play on people who aren't looking out for their own interests, right? Who, who kind of... Although in, in that second one, there's just a lot of like uh, schadenfreude of like, oh, I'm going to take advantage of somebody, but then they got taken advantage of. And, and notice how uh, the fact that you have that seems to legitimize it a lot more, right? In some sense, right? They're yeah. only for, falling for it because they are acting like a dishonest player by trying to take advantage. So it's okay. But l let, let's get scammier. There are big alliances in EVE Online. Uh, they, um, have, they are, being a member of one of these alliances unlocks access to a lot of play in the game. Um, and so people want to apply to join them. But as you know, there's spies and you've got enemies, you, you don't let everybody in. So you have to apply to join a alliance. So one of the, a, a pretty popular form, of, a common form of scamming is recruitment scams. Uh, so I might say, hey, everybody, if you want to join, Test Alliance is looking for new players. If you want to come along to my, if you just click the website, you can apply, testalliance.co.uk. And you might go in, you might click apply, you'll give some details about your account, uh, and then I'll we'll start talking in the game. And the actual official website is testalliance.com, not co.uk. And players register fake domain names to get you to think that you're talking to the real alliance when actually you're talking to a con artist. And these uh. scammers might say, hey, you know, there's a joining fee. You know, it's just it's just an insurance policy. We, if you come join our alliance and then you start killing people in our space, you know, that's on me. So you've got to just put a bit of an in, uh, a bit of a deposit down, a billion isk, whatever. You get it back in two weeks if you don't, um, you know, betray us when you arrive. And 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 there's so many different ways to kind of trick people on this joining process that it can be one of the most profitable forms of scamming, and uh, is is just is is perhaps less that example of someone taking advantage of someone who was already trying to take advantage of me and more saying you've got this player who in full earnest wants to join this alliance and just gets tricked by layers and layers of trickery where we've got fake websites, right. fake software, fake forums, to, 
Th- um, and things that are technically outside of the game. Yep. Like you're not you're you're playing the game, but you're really playing this. You're not in the client. You're you're in you're just in a web browser, but you're still playing. Yeah, there's an interesting sort of magic circle question here, right? Yeah, the way he really has this just enormous like expansiveness where Mm -hmm. playing E is talking on the forums and planning war and planning uh, gameplay on your forums and in your um, Discord servers and and through all of these places. Uh, One of the most apparent, the the historically most powerful alliance in the game has a news website, a gaming news website where they post news about the game and also, also other games. And that website is in itself playing the game because it's propaganda. When you're playing a war between two teams of 10,000 people who are voluntarily logging in every night to fight, the best way to win is to demoralize your opponents. And you can demoralize demoralize your opponents by denying them fun. So you don't turn up to fight. You fight in ways that aren't fun for them to play against. And you can demoralize them by writing news websites, writing news articles on your blog about how they're all falling apart and they all, all the, the, the leaders of that alliance hate each other and they're all, you're all about to get betrayed because they're all about to run off with all your money. So, you could, so the, is, is that website playing EVE Online, putting propaganda out <laughs> and, and trying to persuade people that their alliance is losing when perhaps they're actually not? Is that still playing EVE Online? It's not having it anywhere near the game client. <laughs> The, the probably the most successful, most powerful player uh, in the history of the online, Tiny, probably logs into the game once a year. But he's the most powerful player in the game because the game is so much more than what's happening inside that piece of software. Right. That sounds that sounds amazing. I mean, you know, and it the whole thing just I'm so intrigued by Eve Online. At the same time, I'm thinking, oh man. First of all, I'm very trusting. You know, and <laughs> Andy knows this already. You know, I you know I look for the best in people. Um, I, this is a game with a high learning curve, and sure, you know, every it, you said the number one rule is don't trust anyone, right? So there's another aspect of this too, which is I think important, right? Um, is that the game itself has safe areas? Mm. Like there, the the game is broken into th- into three sections. There's a safe area where you're you can fly around everywhere you want. You nobody can shoot you. It's just it's just not allowed. It's not quite how it works though. So the, no. the, this is generally what's kind of understood is there's there's high security where there is an in-game yep. police, and if I attack you without reason, without provocation, that in-game police will fly in and they will destroy my spaceship. Right. So now you, as a player who doesn't want to engage in, you know player versus player combat. You don't want to get attacked wherever you fly. You think, I can stay in high security space and I will be left alone. I will be okay. So what... But you're not actually disabled from attacking your spaceship. Uh, There's just a consequence of attacking your spaceship. Now, there's a player event called Hulkageddon. Yeah, so they, they have broken the police at least once. So you can beat the police. Wow. So if me and 20 of my friends all fire on fire at your mining ship mm-hmm. uh, at the same time, we destroy your ship before the, poli- before the police turn up to destroy us. And you might think, hey, that's why would 20 of you guys get together and destroy me? You get destroyed too. Well, we're, we're flying in ships worth paper and you're flying in a ship worth diamonds and gold. And we can scoop up the value of that spaceship when you do that. Um, and Hulkageddon is also event Kelly Bergstrom, who also studies Eve Online, who edited the Eve Online Reader with me. She studies Hulkageddon and, and talks about many of the ways in which it's a, it's a form of policing. You can also, they're trying to uh, police who should play and how people should play Eve Online. That if you're not engaging with the player versus player elements, you're not playing the game the right way. Ah. Uh, and so it's that form of gatekeeping. But it oh, was also, it turned out, a form of uh, the Alliance metagame because if we destroy all of the mining ships in high sec, the value of our mining operations in low or null secure, no security space suddenly goes up because we're the right. only ones producing those minerals. <laughs> so there's layers and layers of, of things going on here with this game. It's, it's always more complicated than you first realize. But yeah, so right. there are some areas of the game where generally you can't attack other players, but it's, it's never quite that simple. It's never quite that simple, but, but the fact that they exist... In for the, for the I will call them physical dangers of having your ship blown up, um, but there's not an a, there's not any similar thing for for fraud. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, 
that, that, that definitely, definitely. But there, there is and there isn't. So the better you are at the game, the longer you've played, the the more aware of these things you should be. So I definitely think it's the case that for an, uh, someone who's just started playing is possibly more vulnerable to it. And so in the book, there's an interview that I talk with um, uh, Evil Online CCP Game CEO, um, Hilmar Peterson, and he, he acknowledges that that asymmetry between someone who has been playing the game for a very long time is perhaps maybe not fair because that there's just so, such a power imbalance there of, of a lack of understanding. But the, the game is a game that is unfair because of the way that if the longer you've been playing, the more assets you've acquired and therefore the better your spaceship is and the more powerful you are when you're playing. So if, if you just start playing and you want to come up against me, well, I've got so many more skill points. I've got so many, my ship is so much more powerful than yours. It's going to be very difficult for you to compete against me. But social, we both have the same social skills. We've both got the same, we've got the same access to social skills. So in that way, so the, so the deception of betrayal is perhaps more fair. But that than seems really wrong. The I mean, asymmetrical you, nature of Eve Online's spaceship combat. If if you've been living in the cesspool, you know, of, of betrayal almost for years <laughs> almost twenty years, <laughs> you are equipped in a way that you know that, that that I'm not. It's it's interesting, by the way, to call this game. You know, it's interesting what unfair means here. Right? Yep. Uh, right, because y you're right, and you know the one way I can potentially, uh, if if seniority allows you to crew more, of course, is I could try to create an alliance against you with other weaker people, and you know that's kind of traditional tactics. But if I'm new and you know all the tricks uh, of, uh, you know, it's easy to say, don't trust people while also pitting in the situation where the only way you can survive is by forming alliances with people. And so trusting people. So I have no idea what the nuances of that mean. What do you think? Do you, do you think there are at least some occasions when it's wrong to do that to new players? I guess maybe that's a, you know, it seems to me that You've got me to the point where where I'm completely willing to agree that sometimes treacherous play is just fine. But are there situations when sometimes it's not fine? So I, I'm not here to. to I, I don't want to say, hey, this this isn't this isn't isn't okay. Right? It's up to the players of the game to decide this. And, but what I observed while playing were several instances of players scamming a new player. And then giving everything back once they'd completed the scam with the warning, hey, welcome to Eve Online, you can't trust anyone. There was a real <laughs> honor uh, among that's... thieves among several of the scammers that I spoke to. Right? That so... just, that's just heartwarming, right? <laughs> isn't, isn't that lovely of them? <laughs> and, like, you know, one of the guys, one of my main kind of informants um, showed me transcripts to a scam, and, and he had given that player back more than what he stole. He said, hey, welcome to Eve. You can't trust anyone. This is your lesson. So they got the satisfaction mm -hmm. of having tricked someone in a right. game where everybody is watching out, should be watching out for being tricked. And then, but they didn't need the mi relatively minor in-game advantage that they'd gotten from that scam. Whereas if, you're, if you've been playing the game for six years and I trick you, I'm giving you nothing back. You, th th those, <laughs> those, those players were, should, should know better. In should a sense. know better. And so sure. it was a, it's, it's a way of, we can, we can kind of view this as a way of homogenizing the player base. And this, we can think about this as something that's good or we can think about this as something that's bad. In a sense, it's good because this is a unique game that has a, 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 a long history um, of offering something radically different from what other MMOs and online games are offering people. And so for the players that play it, that is good. It is, it is ni it's, it's nice for them that they've found the opportunity to play the game that they want to play. And, and we, could, we should probably talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about, like, well, what, it's, what is it like to play this game? What is it like to betray someone, be betrayed? How, what's the effect of all of this betrayal that's happening while we're playing this game? But on the other time, this is pushing people out of the game who don't want to play that way. Hulk Hulkageddon, which we mentioned before, the point of Hulk Hulkageddon was to kick people out of the game who didn't want to engage with the game in this kind of hostile and hyper-competitive way. So it, it, it does have a negative effect. Is, is it unethical because now fewer people want to play the game because it's got this scamming in it, it's got this sense of, I don't know if I can trust you, I can't trust anyone, I don't want to have a friend in this game. Is that unethical? Or is that just the game community being shaped 
in the interests of the existing game community, which is un unfortunately, realistically, this is a toxic game community. It's 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 very right. harsh, very mean. But the people who play it like that, and so I'm I don't want to say it, that it's unethical to steal from a new player, or it's not unethical to steal from a from a new player. It's, it's just there there are effects and consequences of all of this, and the right. consequences are people get to play a game that is harder and harsher and meaner, and that's fun. There's an appeal. <laughs> What EVE Online for me shows us, the most powerful thing, is that games can be about so much more than voluntary, light, fun experiences. Games can be about being extremely upset. You know, the players I talk to playing Daisy, literally like throwing their keyboard and breaking it and not being able to, and, and walking away from the game, right? Right, right, right. But players that I spoke to, some of the scammers I spoke to got scammed themselves, got really upset, quit the game, and then came back a month later and was like, I'm going to do that. I want, I want to know what the other side of that experience right. feels like. And and they talk about the consequences of this. Like, you can know more about your own personal ethics because how you felt when you chose to betray someone tells you a little bit about yourself. It can yeah. give you that feeling of empowerment or control that you might be able to just get from being good with a, quick with a gun in Call of Duty, or you can get it from being quick with words in EVE Online. I don't think the experience is so radically different from everything else that we're talking about when we talk about the experiences that games offer us, that it is somehow an effort. But it is just, it is very rare. It is very unusual. But and it has the effect of making the game so much more fun, because if I can't trust anyone, the relationships that I do form have to be so much stronger. We have to meet up in person before I'm willing to give you access to some of my resources, right? We're going to travel to Vegas together every year to go to the Fan Fest in Vegas in order to build these really strong, meaningful relationships that you just don't, I, I don't see myself making in other games. Right. Though, again, these are friendships that are going to last until someone backstabs you. Because that and, and which which uh, which I love uh, you know uh, in in your book you talk about bankers uh, in 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 the game and how essentially bankers essentially exist to provide a social service till the moment they're going to inevitably betray everyone that trusts them and it, it's interesting part of me thinks about this game look part of me thinks wow this is this is an amazing game you know I love that it creates a opportunity for fantasy to to engage like this another part of me is a little worried what this might do psychologically to a person once they spent you know a very long time engaging with people under this kind of understanding that you can have uh, so much mistrust another part of me is oh. concerned about the the fact that you have a toxic community that excludes anyone that doesn't want to play its way because, of course, lots of other games can – it's like I want a place where you can have that, but in lots of other games that's used to really exclude other people in ways that seem and, wrong. And I do think mm. that it is probably – this is a style of play that is unfortunately and probably incompatible with maybe inclusive and open online communities. Right. I think, we can, mm. I think it can work in an inclusive and fun way in well-negotiated tabletop gaming experiences where we mm. can talk about our, what boundaries we are that we have. But online, where right. those boundaries are so constantly evolving and shifting and changing, right. uh, I, th I think it, it, can, it can be really challenging. Or the people, the people who are your about, friends are, are strangers. They really are strangers. They may be your friends yeah. and have been your friends for, for years online, but they're, they're strangers. We, yeah. Look, one of the reasons why I don't necessarily spend much time thinking about these kind of the psych long term psychological effects is because when I'm playing, when people are playing Eve Online, they, they are playing as a character, and they've got they've got an avatar in the game, and they've got their player identity is uh, that is different to their real world identity. They've got their character identity, which is situated in this hyper capitalistic dystopic imaginary. Um, they've got an avatar which is covered in tattoos and body modifications, and is kind of a cyborg like. They're not playing as the person that they're playing with when they go back to work at the accountant's office. There, is, there are separations that we're, we're putting up here. We're playing around with our identities, much mm -hmm. in the same way I think we play with our identities when we're playing cops and robbers. Mm -hmm. uh, when we, the, we are, it, the games have this capacity to enable us to play with, play with it, like, different um, intersubjective moralities. 
while we're playing. We can we can adopt different ways of playing, and and so people seem it seems to be that there's a lot. Now, when we do that with non-player characters, right? When I blow up, um, what's the town I blow up in Fallout Three with a nuclear bomb? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and when I when I when I choose to kill all of the ghouls at Tenpenny Tower, I'm not a bad person because I'm choosing these kind of like plainly evil things with non-player characters. So, is there something about this? Comes back to this question of if I am harming you in a game, another person somehow makes it seem and feel a lot more problematic the the question lingers a bit longer because i'm there is another person who is getting harmed right it's the person that i'm scamming it's the person whose whose alliance suddenly just got broken up because i you know upset i I sowed enough discord that the whole alliance leadership broke up and now the alliance has collapsed right and when i'm when when i'm harmed by somebody who's better than me at poker it's it's the harm is limited to the amount that I have invested. That's the same in Eve. It's, it's the harm is limited to what you've invested into into the game. It doesn't. You're not right. losing your real world job because of. Uh, I'm losing, <laughs> and if we look at something like Survivor, I just cost you a million dollars. <laughs> the right. harm is 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 off scale when we start looking at something like Survivor. So oh, how is it? Yeah, it's opportunity cost, right? Yeah, we, we were talking to T Nguyen. Um, about yep. agency in games, and you know, and he was he was talking about how you know how much he's up, how much he applies the sort of agencies he has in games to to real life, and how his biggest concern about the harm of video games is not like people violently killing each other, but people becoming essentially obsessively pursuing over uh be, people let's say become obsessively capitalistic you know mm-hmm. aggressively pursuing resources in a very systematic way and it's interesting and I, none of us are psychologists here you know none right. of us can really kind of but i'm i'm not as easily dismissive of the long-term psychological impact on this um again it's not like you're going to go hurt anybody but part of me does wonder if being a part of a hyper hyper competitive world doesn't leave your uh, character impacted in some yeah, way. And, and look, I talked to these players about it. I, and research methodology, no one's going to tell me. Yep, yeah, I think it makes me a worse person. But <laughs> it does. They talked about the ways in which it does affect them. It makes they felt like it made them more confident. If you're spending, if you're scamming people, the worst someone can do is say no. And that that kind of confidence, social confidence, applies elsewhere. Um, mm-hmm. I talked to a, a, a woman who was a um, homemaker who, uh, and she felt that scamming made her feel so, like she was this kind of badass pirate type persona in the game. <laughs> and it made her feel so powerful. That, and, and she was like, that feeling carries on for me in the rest, in, in my day to day life. And, and, that, and that's why I do it. And, and so, that's amazing. Is, is, there, yeah. is there a long term, now, well, there are a lot of, on, if there are long-term effects, right? There are. We, we've always got to say if it's games for health, right? If there are, if games can be used for health, they can be used to make us fat and unhealthy. It's the <laughs> right, same right. with this, right? If there right. are negatives, if we're worried about the negative psychological effects, I think we need to take a moment and pause and think about, hey, well, what are the positive psychological effects of people who are more in tune with their own morality, um, who, in the face of betrayal and scamming and espionage can still form meaningful and real relationships that are perhaps more ongoing and long-term than the the casual relationships we form in Fortnite where nothing is at stake. All right. Uh, It's a great way to finish it up, Marcus. I love it. That's an amazing, amazing thought. Uh, Thank you very much, Marcus Carter. Uh, Check out his new book, A Treacherous Play. Uh, Good podcast, guys. GP. Um, Play nice, everybody. You can subscribe and listen to all of our episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. 